Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked to down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. I am the bard, who has seen heroic last stands from both sides, and knows that they are only remembered as heroic if they somehow survive, for history is written by the victors, and this too is heresy against the story. The paladins do not know this, yet, but still see no reason to stand and fight an army of the dead if they do not have to. As such, they tactically retreat. Or in other words, they turned tail and ran for their lives down the one passageway that didn't have the sound of a small army of skeletal dwarves with magical powers coming from it. As they ran down the passage, something else was running in the opposite direction. Towards the mountain, towards the paladins. The demon Elaitham had made moved like a fell wind, like a rushing stream somehow still stagnant. It came down the Dwarven hills and across the beach with unnatural speed for something its size. The executioner was here. The paladins rushed down the twisting passages of the abandoned hold, Andre occasionally turning to fire an arrow back down the passageway, laden with some magic of binding or repulsion to keep the dead back. The dead were many, but they were slow, and the actions of Andre slowed them further. Still, it did not slow them enough that the paladins could afford to move at any pace other than a sprint. Senkit led the way. They did not have time to check for traps, so she would go first. With her divine armor and shield, she alone had been unscathed by the mysterious black powder weapons they had encountered earlier. She flinched as she heard several roaring explosions like the ones in the trap room, and then turned back as she realized the attack had come from behind. The dead had brought up several skeletons carrying long metal tubes, with smoke coming out of their ends. She heard the air zip as a bullet passed by her ear. The weapons were devastating, but fortunately not very accurate at anything but close range. The ones who had just fired dropped back and began to pour more black powder down the long metal tubes as several more stepped up with new tubes. They roared again, and again the inaccurate muskets sent bullets whizzing past the paladins, glancing off the stone walls with sparking sounds, then that group fell back. From this the paladins learned several things. Firstly, that the black powder they had discovered was what was being used to propel the bullets with such force. Secondly, the enemy could deploy such a devastating weapon among its troops, similarly to a unit of crossbowmen. Thirdly, unlike crossbows, the black powder weapons were inaccurate at even medium range. The paladins were likely no more than 90 feet ahead of their opposition at the longest, and yet the shots went wild. Finally, the weapons clearly required a rather long time to reload, or else the dead would not have brought up additional units. At the moment, they could only exploit the weakness of their enemy at range. With as many dead as were coming, taking advantage of the long reload time to launch a counterattack and remove the obstacle would be foolishly risky. But it was an option to consider if they could loose their opponents and retake the initiative. They raced onwards until they broke from the corridor into a wide hall. At one end sat a stone throne upon a raised dais. The throne overlooked a long room which itself sat upon a sort of plateau above an entrance hall which led to the great gate. The paladins had run all the way to the base of the mountain. Of course, at the moment they did not care. The only thing they were concerned about was whether there were yet more undead in here. After a quick scan by Julian and Dundry confirmed there were not, the paladins turned back to the passage from which they came. The passageway had a great stone door that opened into this room, and Soka's door took it and pulled. The door was solid stone, and incredibly heavy. Once, it had swung easily on smooth hinges, 
but those hinges had rusted to the point where they might as well have been stoned themselves. Cause Dor was a mighty man indeed, and the door began to swing shut, but too slowly. Farron joined him in and together they forced the door shut just as the undead reached it and began to fire their black powder weapons through. Cause Dor took another scratch along the side of his neck as a bullet grazed him, but the door was shut. He stepped back, realizing they had nothing to bar it with, and so unleashed his fire. The sudden brilliance in the dark hold momentarily blinded the rest of the party, and they turned their eyes away. Cause Dor unleashed the hottest fire he could, for as long as he could, and Farron stepped back in awe. All Dragonborn bore the gift of a breath weapon, but cause Dor's resembled that of a true dragon. Farron eyed the cloak of crimson scales that adorned cause Dor's back suspiciously, and then the fire went out. Cause Dor took a few steps back and sat down on an old stone bench where petitioners sat in ages long past. The door was glowing cherry red, and rapidly cooling. Cause door had melted it into the wall, fusing it to the mountain. Not even a giant would be able to break it down now. Knee. Ever. Tried. Something. Like. That. Before. Cause door panted as he regained his breath, glad it worked. He said, grinning despite his burning lungs. Well, it should buy us some time at least until they find another way in or bring up enough pickaxes. Boom. Dust fell from the distant roof and the floor shook, throwing up yet more dust. Boom. 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 Whatever it was, it was swift, and it continued to shake the hall with enough force to shake every particle of dust loose. The paladins covered their noses and Kazdor flapped his wings, blowing the dust back and away. What in the nine bloody hells is it now? Cuz Dor asked, rather irritated. Boom. 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 Whatever it was, it was coming from the other end of the hall. Eort stepped up and peered across and then came to a sudden realization. The other end of the hall was indeed the great gate that they had been unable to get open. Whatever was causing that noise was also clearly lacking the password. Unlike the paladins though, it had apparently decided that rather than finding a way in, it would make a way in. Boom. 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 The gate was visibly shuddering at each blow. Eeyore didn't know what kind of monster it would take to break open a solid stone gatehouse and he didn't want to be around to find out, particularly if it decided to come after them. Which? considering their luck and the general disposition of more or less everything in this land towards the party, was highly likely. We should probably get moving. Eort commented as he began to see cracks of light starting to form on the gate. I, R, am working on it. Kazdor said. He was stood behind the throne, examining the stone wall, carved with many runes and figures. Andre, give me a hand here. Ye elves can wear secret doors or dinny ye? Yes, but why would there be a door there? Andre asked as she moved up and began to study the wall here elf, pressing a pointy deer to it and tapping with her dagger. My folks Holzner showed a real hold to any outsider, if we mean to get at the heart where the drake'll be, we need to reach the inner hold, and there's usually a door in the false throne room. False throne? Julian asked curiously. The war floor was one of the few areas he wasn't well versed in, mostly as the Dwarven style of magic was not particularly useful for anyone not already a masterful smith or stonemason. Aye, the true throne is near place any of us have any place been though. Kuz responded. The way he spoke about it was the same way a priest might speak of the innermost sanctum of a temple. Julian raised an eyebrow curiously. Don't forget to check for traps. Peregrine mentioned. Senkit looked at him curiously, and he raised his hands helplessly. What? I was a highwayman not a cat burglar, I wouldn't know where to start so don't look at me. Boom. 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 Farron stopped and looked at the gate, which was beginning to tremble. The cracks were still paper thin. 
but one of the doors was starting to bend inward ever so slightly, as the repeated force pushed it backwards against its hinges. The doors were too sturdy to break, but whatever it was hitting them had started to push it in so hard that it was digging into the stone around it. You are all remarkably calm considering we've got an army of the dead trying to break in on one side and what sounds like a titan trying to break in on another. Honestly, this isn't even the worst situation we've found ourselves in. Senkit said with a chuckle. Try having two armies breathing down your neck. Knowles and Orcs both. Boom. 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 The last boom sounded particularly final, as the door cracked open. It was no more than a sliver, one even a small cat would have time fitting through, but the impact ceased. And it came through. It seemed at first to be exceedingly thin as it slipped through, but the form soon expanded out to its usual dimensions. It resembled a massive hooded figure draped head to toe in black robes. It stood almost 15 feet tall and seemed half as broad, a grossly over-muscled brute. Two burning purple eyes stared out from the depths of its hood, and in its hands it held a massive two-handed execution as sword almost as tall as it was. Andri moved from her work on the secret wall and walked up to the end of the king's platform to look down on it and froze. Her hands began to shake and she started to back away, breathing growing more rapid. She bumped into Julian as she retreated, and he placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. Courage, dearest. He told her, with gentleness she had rarely seen from him before. His will and talent for mind affecting magic flowed into her, pressing down her fear and bolstering her courage. She gave him a nod of thanks as the creature began to move forwards, slowly at first, until it lifted its head and saw the paladins. Then it raised its sword. Its fists were caked in stone dust. Execution a demon. Andre warned them. Elate him's personal enforcers. Don't get in its reach, that sword cares about as much about your armor as those black powder weapons. That would be a problem, not simply because the paladins were a highly melee-focused group but also because the Exus world was far, far too fast for anything of its bulk. It planted one leg forwards, leaning forwards onto it, and sort of sprang, leaping forwards on one leg and landing on the opposite, where it sprang again, this time moving even faster thanks to its momentum. It was almost graceful, and was eerily silent. It was like a specter of death was rushing towards the paladin's battle line. The paladins drew up on the stairs in an inverted triangle, Andri at the back, Julian, Senkit, and Farron in front of her, with Peregrine and the Ort on the wings. Kazdor continued working on finding the door. Andri fired twice into it, the first arrow exploding with a blast of thunder that echoed throughout the hall. The monster didn't even flinch, its body rippled back, like a bowl of jello that had been hit in the side, but it kept on, just as swift as before. The monster charged straight down the middle of the formation, seeming not to care about losing the high ground or being flanked. It swung at Senkit, and even she, the best armored of all the group, leapt back as the monster swung its blade. The sword came in low, in an uppercut swing that split the stone like butter as it came in. She leapt back up two sets of stairs to dodge the sweep, and then flinched as a cut appeared on her cheek. The blade had missed, but had cut the air with enough force to turn it into a lacerating wind. This was the incredible sharpness and power behind that blade. It turned its blade and cut out at head height against Julian, which was about chest height at Farron. Julian ducked, the sword cutting off several inches of the hair which he had allowed to grow long. Farron on the other hand tried to block the blow, and succeeded. The impact sent out a shockwave which threw back a small cloud of dust, and would have shattered any ordinary blade. Even a weakly enchanted weapon would have been destroyed, but Mitral Flame was no ordinary weapon. Even still, the ancient sword shuddered, and Farron felt his feet lift off the ground. 
The several hundred pound dragonborn went flying black several feet and he landed in a sprawl, falling down several sections of the stairs as he landed with the wind blown from his lungs. Eort and Peregrine lunged in from the sides while the creature was flanked, driving their blades forwards. The cloak the creature wore was strong as steel though, and Eort's thrust was turned away. Peregrine, with his shorter reach, struck second, and having seen Eort's attack fail, tried a series of slashes instead. His swords did little themselves, but the flames engulfing them lingered on the cloak. It might have been rather mightily enchanted cloth, but it was at a basic level still cloth, and bore magic to resist impacts, not flames. The demon seemed to recognize this and stepped up the stairs, and to the side, pivoting as it gained the high ground over Peregrine and swept down at him. The halfling leapt back as the blade cleaved away the edges of the stairs and landed rather farther down without incident. In doing so, it turned its back to Senkit and Julian though, who both ignited their own blades and charged. The demon lashed out as Senkit as she entered its reach, but her perfect defense protected her once again. The Vorpal sword struck the Archangel's shield and was deflected. The infernal paladin rushed inside the monster's reach and struck it twice, each blow mauling the cloak armor with thorn and fire. The monster did not move except to extract its sword from the stairs where it had stuck after being parried. It swung it out over Senkit's head to knock aside Julian's sword as it came down towards it. There was a sound like screaming as the impact shaved a sliver of the blade off and knocked it aside. Julian's arms ached as the blow strained his muscles, but he forced the grey sword's momentum to stop, then turn. He cut in again, and the demon smashed his sword onto the stone floor, nearly ripping it out of his hands. The executioner's eyes burned with rage towards the Arsima, and it likely would have taken his head if not for the sudden appearance of a silver shaft in its face, or perhaps where a face should have been. None could tell whether there actually was anything under that hood. A second arrow struck it, and burst into flame. For the first time, the executioner made a sound. It screamed. The wail was entirely unlike anything else in this world, or any other. It bore in it all the hatred and fury and pain of the enemy, not merely the echo of that great darkness named Elaidum. A sound of pure hatred that made the paladin's hearts turn to ice, but only for a moment. Then it was answered by a cry of defiance, as Farron charged back in. Burn and die. Ibbahaliyaiq's Bahamut. The dragonborn shouted as he charged in and let loose his flame at point-blank range. The demon recoiled under the dragon fire, before a hand shot out and grabbed the dragonborn by the throat, crushing his windpipe like a tinker and cutting off the flame. While still holding down Julian's sword with one hand, the demon flung Farron like a ragdoll at Andri. She hadn't seen this coming, and 700 pounds of gold dragonborn hit her at bone-breaking force. Farron's momentum carried them both up over the top of the stairs and onto the Lord's Plateau. Its sword switched between its hands in a blink, and with its newly freed hand it backhanded Julian away. The Arsimmer's helmet crumpled onto his face and he went rolling down the stairs with a great clatter. Eort nodded to Peregrine to go help Julian as he took his blade in both hands and struck with all his might. The blade hit home in the monster's neck and sank deeply, with a roar of lighting that left the entire room smelling of ozone. The monster leaned slightly to the left as Eort dropped behind it, then leaned back. Eort struck again, plunging the blade into a gab burned in the armor up to the hilt, and ripping it out and to the side. What lay beneath was neither tissue nor flesh, but rather the same sort of stinking yellowish goop Elaitum was made of. Eort thanked whatever god was listening for small blessings though, for the wound did not regenerate. Unfortunately for Senkit, the wound did not slow or seriously injure the executioner either, and it came on him a full charge, crossing the distance between them in two great strides. It swung. And missed. The blade bit into the stairs under her and stuck. This caught Senkit quite off guard, 
but she took advantage of it and raised her mace to strike. Then the demon stepped forwards onto its blade. Its tremendous weight, applied to the lever that was its sword, broke off the section of the stair sink it was standing on and threw her into the air, off balance. Then it swung its other weapon, its fist. The same kind of blow that forced open the stone doors of the dwarven hold hit Senkit in the chest, and her world spun. The divine armor could protect her, but only so much. She saw the top of the stairs whirled past and she realized she must easily have been blow sixty feet away. In other words, it was going to seriously hurt when she slammed into the stone floor. But she didn't. Strong arms, arms just as strong as the ones that blew her away, caught her. I am the bard, and I strongly dislike sap, but I tell the story as it happened, Anker's door caught her. He had found the door and opened it, and had come to join the fight. Healing magic flowed over her as Kaz door set her down and drew his axes. The demon came bounding up the stairs, and Sivred fled, driving the dragon prince onwards. Your kind are not welcome in my kindred's house. Kaz door awed, and he meant it. Traitors or no, even the duel were dwarves, and a demon had no place in a dwarf hold. Dragon fire blasted the executioner demon as it summited the stairs and came before the throne of the king, burning away the last of its armored shroud. Then an axe met its face, and the sound of the hammer upon the anvil rang out in the hold for the first time in many years. The demon fell back several steps, nearly toppling over. Kazdor brought both axes down and the demon raised its massive sword to block, but swayed. It was larger and heavier, but Gazdor was just as strong, and had a higher ground and leverage. His axes pushed harder, ready to throw the demon back. Then the demon's blade turned, and cut through the axes at the handle. Two steel axe heads, shinned so much that they resembled silver, but lacking the enchantments needed to stand before such a fell blade, fell to the stone stairs with a clatter, and the blade cut on. Kazdor staggered back onto his feet. His armor had been cut clean through, save for the mitral axes that served as his holy symbol. Dragon's blood sprayed onto the demon from a deadly and deep cut that ran across both his upper arms and chest. He seemed almost confused as the demon brought its sword up. An executioner's sword has no point, but regardless, the demon drove the blunt end of it into the mitral that had so defied its slash with all its might. Kazdor had known that ribs and sternum could shatter, though he had never felt all of them do so at once. He did not know that armor could shatter, and yet his came apart like breaking glass with a terrible sound. Or was that Senkit screaming? He didn't have the presence of mind to tell as she whipped past him, a red and silver blur. Kazdor's body and armor was not all that was broken though, for he flew back and struck the false throne of the dwarf hold. And the throne was broken, for there was no king and drake in feasting. I am the bard, who has witnessed the truth that a new world is only ever born from the ashes of the old. In this man, Shiva is a truth within the story, and so is echoed throughout any tale that tells of the end of an age. For this is an echo of death that inevitable goal of life, that even now hung near to the paladins, as Kazdor lay mortally wounded upon the broken throne. Not that they would have much time to mourn him, though he had not yet passed, but lingered on the threshold between life and death. For the executioner was not done. It loomed at the pinnacle of the stairs, its armored cloak completely burned away, revealing it in all its horrific glory. It looked somewhat like a dark elf, if a drow had been molded with an ogre and grossly bloated over with muscle. It completely lacked fat and skin, and was nothing but a ball of taut muscle stretched and swollen into a roughly humanoid shape. It had no bones, but was instead kept upright by sheer muscle and the impossible construction was permitted only by dark magic. Its eyes were small, and sunken deeply into its head. They gleamed like those of the undead, but with little or no intelligence. This was not a strategist or even a remotely bright creature, rather simply a pure brute. 
but a pure brute was enough. The paladins had little time to mourn as the monster turned to deal with Senkit and Dundry, who were still trying to disentangle from each other. But before it could take a step, a snap echoed throughout the hall, and then a bolt of lighting tore out and smashed the demon in the face. Already off balance from Kazdor's barrage, the bolt sent it tumbling back down the stairs as Julian stalked back up. The Arsimer clawed his dented grethelm off his face with only a mild amount of cursing as the rubbery ball of murderous muscle bounced down the stairs past him and onto the floor with a crash. Fun fact, I can't direct where the bolt comes from. He informed the smoking mass, and then took several steps back up the stairs and grabbed his sword in something resembling a panic. The demon was getting back up. It had still taken an absolute mauling from the lightning bolt, but it wasn't done, and it was staggering to its feet, ready to resume its rampage. Julian shot a look up the stairs towards the Oort, who shook his head. Kazdor wasn't getting up any time soon. The War Master considered his options, and ready the plan in mere seconds, but seconds were a rare commodity. Yort, Senkit, Andri, take us through that passage he opened and shut it behind you. Farron, Peregrine and I will keep this thing busy. It hates fire after all, and we're all packing flaming weapons. Giles, we need to talk about volunteering other people for dangerous missions, but I agree. Go. Peregrine responded with a nod. It can kill us with one blow and is too fast to allow for healing. This is going to be interesting. Farron muttered as he picked himself back up and white blood from the corner of his mouth. The rest of the paladins retreated, pouring the rest of their healing magic into his door. It wasn't enough to completely heal him, but he stabilized, and more importantly he could move. Leaning heavily on Senkit for support, he staggered into the hidden passage behind the throne. Seg. Do me a favor and keep an eye on Farron, would you? I won't have need for wings in these tunnels, and my lungs are too badly damaged for another breath weapon. I'll keep him safe, keep yourself safer. The wings responded before they slipped off cause and moved swift as a shadow to bomb the new with Farron. The dragonborn had but a moment to flex his newly acquired wings, still as scarlet as they were upon his door, before the demon regained its feet and began charging back up the stairs. We stop it on the landing. No high ground for us, but with as quick as it is, it can reverse that and gain an advantage too easily. It doesn't get to the throne floor until Kaz and the others are clear. Julian ordered the blazing trinity. For Kaz then. Peregrine responded. And for Drake in feasting. Farron growled as the demon came on. Julian was the first to meet it. He did not raise his sword to block, knowing it would be futile. Nor did he dive out of the way as the demon cut in with a horizontal slash. He stared the chaos creature in the face, and raised his blade above his head into wrath stands. A blow came in to cut the foolish paladin in half. And it stopped dead against a sword forged of invincible crimson willpower. The demon was strong, but Julian's will was stronger. Even still, the spiritual weapon cracked. But it slowed the monster down, giving the other two an opportunity. Farron charged in from the opposite side, mitral flame whirling. The demon reached out a hand to block it, the mighty blade carving two long canyons into the massive palm. Peregrine leapt up from behind the dragonborn, racing up the trunk like calm, dragon's teeth blades digging into the demon's flesh as they trailed low behind him. Peregrine struck true, and drove his sword into the demon's eye, dark power surging through and turning the blade's flames black. Vine erupted from the blinded socket as Peregrine leapt off, a killer's grin on his face. Only his peerless combat instinct saved him as the demon turned and lashed out with its executioner's sword. The blade did not touch him, for he leapt back almost as soon as his feet touched the stone landing. Even still, the air cut by the sword's passing tore open the side of his face, laying open his cheek to the bone. 
the demon turned the blade to its flat end and ripped it back through the air, all the way from one side of its body to the other. The wind exploded with the sound of a scream, and the shockwave blew the paladins back. Julian heard the wind whistle again and braced himself. His block was nothing short of perfect, and that was all that saved his life. He heard his bones snap as the force of the demon's sword struck his guard and kept going, stopping almost a centimeter into his neck. But broken bones and near decapitations was not enough to stop a paladin. Julian screamed in defiance and pulled his head and saw their way, ducking under the swipe and leaving into the monster's belly with a wild cut. He planted one boot upon the stone and lunged forwards, driving his blade forth into the executioner's forearm and then ripping it out and to the side. Farron was not idle either, as he soared in on borrowed wings and cut the monster across the back from shoulder to hip. Golden light and mitral fire lighting the darkened hall like sun and moon in joyous dalliance. He wasn't dumb either, as he offered an arm up, heaving Peregrine over his head, allowing the halfling to do his best work. Both blades drove into the demon's neck up to the hilt, and then he ripped them back out. Yellows rained down on the paladins. Every last one of those blows would have felled any other creature. Any living beast would have succumbed three times over. Any undead would have had the basic mechanisms the dark magic used to move utterly undone. But this was a demon. It was not even a mockery of a natural creature like the undead are, it was entirely different. It would not exist, could not exist outside of a nightmare or the ravings of a madman and yet it did. It was chaos, and it did not bleed, it did not break and it would not be destroyed so easily. Peregrine ducked and blocked the slash that came as it nearly tore him in half. Even perfectly parried, the force slammed him into the ground at terminal velocity. His vision swam and he tasted metal in his mouth as the back of his head slammed into the hard stone. The executioner spanned nearly a full rotation as it brought its blade down on Julian. The spiritual weapon interposed itself once more, and the crimson echo of Julian's sword shattered as badly as the original had. Julian had no hope to touch back or to the side, and any attempt to block would be equally futile. Therefore he chose the only path still available to him and charged headlong into the arms of death, cutting for all he was worth, the blow which would have rendered Julian half the man he used to be instead only tore off the top half inch of his skin, from shoulder blades to his calves, along with all of his armor. Julian howled in agony as he lost nearly half his skin, and vengeful spirit bit deep, and he stepped forwards past the monster. At the same time, Farron struck it from the other side, cutting in a similar manner. With an awful ripping sound, the two paladins nearly tore the demon in half. The executioner fell, and its sword fell from its hands, tumbling down the stairs. The paladins stared over the fallen foe, breathing heavily. Julian healed his lacerated skin, and Peregrine his wounded head. Is it dead? It isn't vanishing. Farron asked worriedly. My sword permanently kills demons. It's dead. It has to be, that was far too cool an attack to be anything less than the finishing blow. Julian responded. The demon sat back up. You had to jinx it. Peregrine shouted as he leapt at the monster. It interposed its hand and tossed him away. Farron and Julian rushed it, brining their blades down, biting into the thick forearm of the beast. The demon staggered, slowly, but inexorably, to its feet, and then threw the paladins back on their heels. It stepped towards them, bringing one foot down with a thunderous boom as it raised its fist. Well, fuck. Cursed Farron. The other four paladins felt a hidden door fall shut behind them and they continued on into the dark, cause Dor's breathing was ragged, and his movements were slow, but he was breathing, and he was moving. His armor was utterly ruined, barely hanging on in scraps around his shoulders. Every symbol of Clan Glamdring was broken and gone, his holy symbol fallen by the wayside. Worst of all his axes, his pride and joy, were no more. 
his claw weakly found his hammer. At least he still had it if nothing else. They moved on through the halls as quickly and as quietly as they could. Senkit's armor began to glow with a soft golden light, allowing his door to still see even in the pitch dark tunnels. Eort noticed something in the glow though, something he wasn't able to see in the grey world of dark vision. The walls were in fact lined with gold. The hobgoblin looked at them with awe as he realized the walls he was walking alongside were in fact a series of massive, ornate murals depicting the history of the clan. It was an awe-inspiring sight, a treasure worth every bit as much as a dragon's hoard, if not in raw value, but for the art. But the history was now barely visible. The walls here were covered in the black vines, clearly visible and unwilling or unable to retreat before the light of Senkip's divine armor. We must be getting close to the source if they're manifesting in the real world. Andri considered, her breath misting in the air. It was growing colder as they entered deeper into the hold. They kept going until they came to another junction, as they looked to try and find Weka's door heard a voice, one that sounded quite familiar. Take the second tunnel on your left. It told him, and he looked around wildly. It was a man's voice, and that of an old man at that. There was nobody there. Take the second tunnel on your left. It told him again. Weka's door checked his back. Sivrid was definitely gone, and there was nobody here. He looked this way and that, dropping his hand to the hilt of his hammer. The rest of the party looked at him concernedly as he looked around frantically, before he felt a subtle surge of energy from his hammer, like the breath of a clean, clear mountain top breeze. He looked down at it. Take the second tunnel on your left, and hurry. They are enemies coming. The voice warned him. Kazdor took the chance and trusted the voice. They took the second tunnel on their left, the tunnel wound down and down again, twisting through the mountain until they came to a door, which they opened with some difficulty. The room was filled with casks, and the smell made it unmistakable. They had found the brewery. Ah, Kaz, I know you're probably hurting like no tomorrow, but now is not the right time for a drink. Eort commented. Ah, I'm knee here for a drink laddie. Kazdor said as he walked forwards, raising a bloody stained claw to one of the far walls. He pushed, and the wall turned, revealing a secret passageway. How did you know that was there? Andre asked suspiciously, even her keen senses had not detected it. My father showed me. Kazdor said. It's just like the one at home. There was then a sudden sound coming from behind them, the sound of tapping, of skeletal feet. The dead were coming, and they were coming in numbers. Well, lucky us. Let's go. Eort responded and moved hurriedly past Kaz's door and into the room beyond. The dragonborn put out an arm to stop him, but his wounds slowed him. Andri and Senkit noticed and gave him a concerned look. Kazdor hung his head and walked into the room, and the others followed. He shut the door behind them. They found themselves in a spacious but spartan room. In it there was a large pool of water, that despite being so deep underground shone, as though a bright starlit night shone over it. By the light of the pool there were three books. And a simple stone carved throne. I am the bard who has seen the great evils of the world turn upon one another time and time again, and yet it is not a good thing, for the righteous perish in the struggle, and the victory turns stronger for being blooded. But few evils I have known, at least few evil individuals, could match the horror which even now pulled itself back to its feet before Julian and the rest of his blazing triumvirate. Are you kidding me? We practically cut it in half. Peregrine complained as the monster swung its massive fist and pulverized the stone where the halfling had been standing a moment before. Beyond that, with two weapons specialized in dealing with such creatures. Julian muttered. I suspect one of two possibilities. The first is that this demon possesses such extreme tenacity that overwhelming physical trauma is not enough to bring it down or banish it which would be a practically unique ability, or 
Julian's mussings were interrupted as the creature nearly broke him in two with another swing, which the Arsimer deftly avoided. It was created on this plane, meaning it cannot be banished or undone, even by magical weapons. Even after nearly being killed by this monster three times over, and having his armor utterly destroyed, Julian was still a scholar at heart. His voice was not one of a warrior fighting for his life, but rather an interested researcher. Farron once again began to doubt the sanity of his angelic companion. Though we did at least slow it down. That will be important. Important for what? If we can't kill it with our swords, what exactly do you have in mind to slay this thing? Farron asked as he deflected another punch, shearing off layers of muscle as he did so. But the demon was completely unfazed. It's a classic plan, one passed down from warrior to warrior since time immemorial. It is the ultimate strategy to survive against an overwhelmingly strong opponent. Fall back down the stairs, and Peregrine, get on Farron's back. Julian said, a crazy grin on his face as he laid into the demon's kneecaps and slipped back from the retaliation. Farron's eyebrows would have shot up if he had them. To see the high ground to an opponent that already surpassed them in all physical aspects was an exceedingly unorthodox, even foolish move. Still, he trusted the strategist and fell back down the stairs out of the demon's reach. Julian had gone for the legs, and mentioned how the monster had clearly been slowed by its previous wounds. Did the War Master perhaps intend to see the high ground in order to bait a charge and perhaps trip the beast up? Or perhaps it was to target the legs further in order to prevent the beast from moving and then finish it off with ranged attacks? Now then. Julian said with a grin. Execute phase two. The Arsima turned, sheathed his weapon, and started sprinting for the door. Run away. Farron stared at him dumbstruck. It was not entirely unreasonable to quit the battlefield in the face of a superior foe, to regroup with their allies perhaps, but even then you at least pretended it wasn't running away. This wasn't merely strategy or cowardice, this was cowardice that was honest with itself. Still, he had a point, and staying here to try to finish it off himself would be futile, and so Farron turned as well and the blazing trinity fled the hold with the roaring demon swift on their heels. I hope you have an actual plan other than simply fleeing like the chicken you so resemble. Farron commented as he caught up with the rapidly retreating Asima. I always have a plan Goldie. Julian responded, mildly miffed at being called a chicken. He had so enjoyed the end of the various foul jokes made at his expense, and it seemed the new member of the party was no less unoriginal. It's a good thing cause loaned you the wings or you'd be in quite a spot of trouble. I fail to see how adding literal flight to our metaphorical flight aids us in actually defeating that thing rather than simply running away from it more effectively. That, my gilded friend, is because you forget something very important. The demon is not the only absurdly dangerous monster living in the volcano. Julian responded, and then he turned back to the gate, igniting his wings and taking flight. Farron soared after him moments later on Sivrid, Peregrine clinging tightly to his back. The demon came barreling out of the gate after them, unable quite to reach them with the mighty leap, though it surely would have if it were not so grievously wounded. As the paladins soared on upwards towards the peak, the executioner climbed after them, just barely slower. Soon, they crested the lip of the volcano's mouth and looked down, down into a deep darkness that swallowed up the sun. It should have been too hot for any but Kazan sank it to bear here, but instead a deathly chill stole out of the volcano. There was no smell of sulfur or the other fumes one might expect, but only the stench of decay and death, for the volcano had been swallowed up by the blight. Despite the peril, the burning trinity plunged into the gullet of mac darkness, and the executioner came diving after them. Julian's eyes swept the darkness, hoping to see some floor or ledge he could veer off to and let this monster plummet into the dark where it would never reappear. His wings were flickering, 
His magic was almost gone and if he didn't land soon he would fall as helplessly as the demon. And then his vision went black, and a wave of cold agony swept over him. His entire body was baptized in necrotic energy that ripped away at flesh and soul. It had come out of nowhere, or perhaps he simply had been unable to see the heat signature of whatever had produced it, if such a thing produced heat at all. The blast caught Farron, Peregrine, and the demon all at once, blinding and withering all of them. Julian and Farron flailed about in the dark, but one member of the party did not need eyes to see. Sigvid guided the Dragonborn's hand to Julian's, the two seizing each other tightly and not letting go as they spiraled down, down, down. And they kept falling, even as Sivrid tried in vain to pull them away, it felt like they were falling forever. And then the loyal mantle slammed them into a wall, they fell for a moment more, and then landed with a crash. The only way that Julian was certain he wasn't unconscious, or dead was because he simply hurt far too much. He felt around in the absolute darkness for the hilt of his sword and drew it, willing it into flame. He felt the heat, even in the freezing chill of the dark. It was like lying in a tomb. He heard the sounds of battle, of mighty blows falling upon something, and the roaring of the demon yet again. It went on for perhaps a minute more, then ceased. Julian's eyes finally cleared as something like tar ran out of them like black tears and he managed to force himself to his feet. He had landed on his left arm, and it was completely useless. Even his tremendous willpower could not make it move any longer. He looked around. Peregrine was coming back in to shape himself. The small halfling did not have enough mass to have been quite as seriously injured, but he was still in bad shape nursing a broken leg that he mended, barely able to stand. Farron had taken the worst of it and was out cold. Julian stabilized him, but that was all he could do. His magic was completely drained, and Peregrine gave up the last of his healing to revive him. The dragonborn groaned back into consciousness and forced himself up. His magic was not quite as badly drained, and he managed to fix Julian's arm. Still, they were in a sorry state, badly wounded and out of magic, they looked about, using their flaming weapons like torches to find where they were. They were stood on a ledge of sorts, an outlook hanging over the endless abyss of the Caldera. They looked all about and found a large door nearby that they pushed open and slipped inside. They didn't know what was in there, but it was better than sitting out in the dark completely exposed. What they found inside were dead bodies, quite a few of them in fact. They were all dwarves, and all clad in sets of what would have once been truly magnificent armor. Greatest of all there was a titanic dwarf, or perhaps one that had simply died while under the effects of an enlargement spell. His armor was perhaps once golden, but centuries of rest in this rotten place had stained it irrevocably black. Baroque and ornate, armor fit for the greatest of kings and emperors. On its pauldrons were roaring lions, and its chest held the wings of an eagle, with a single red gemstone, like a great eye, in the center of them. Julian looked upon the armor, pondering how similar the central symbol was to his original sword. He reached out an arm, and touched the gemstone, and the armor sprang to life. Forged not by normal means, but with the strangest power of Cernix, the armor flowed like water off the dead king, enveloping Julian in a wave of liquid metal. The Arsimer vanished before he even had time to scream. Meanwhile, back in the hidden truth throne room, the rest of the paladins fell very quiet as they realized where they were exactly. This was not a place they would have been allowed in under any circumstance, for despite it being much plainer than the outer false throne, it radiated majesty in a way that the sham never could with a dragon's hoard worth of gold. It is a well-known fact of the arcane that the oldest magic is the strongest, for magic is itself a living thing, unlike any living thing, it matures as it ages, and unlike those that live in flesh, magic has no upper limit on how powerful it may become. Even the power of dragons paled before truly ancient magic. 
It was also a well-known fact that dwarves, Dowager included, were not particularly magical creatures. Even the Grey Dwarves used the strange power of Cynics rather than the more understood science of arcane magic. They had the power of their gods of course, but even the Gnolls had that. However, Dwarves did not produce sorcerers or wizards with any real frequency, and so it was understood that the Dwarven folk, while sturdy and excellent warriors, were not a particularly magical race. Unlike the first fact, the second fact was dead wrong. Mortals in general, and humans in particular, are foolish creatures. They expect things to go exactly as they know them to go, and so if there is a difference in method, it is assumed to be a difference in kind. The dwarves did not produce mages, so therefore they did not produce magic. However, the dwarves did produce a certain kind of magic. It was woven into them, into their holds, their armor, their weapons. Runes were the explicit form of these, but the power of a dwarven hold was not merely arcana. Traditions, beliefs, laws, histories, and oaths. These things all possess a power of their own, or how else would they bind so many? And with the dwarves, these were their magic, woven in and as fundamental to them as the stone the holds were carved from. It was the power of things so old that the reasons behind them was forgotten. The same kind of power as a true bard summons when the tale ancient is told anew with new faces and settings. It could be called the story, or the axiom, or perhaps simply the oath. It was the power of fundamental beliefs and ideas that are never stated but can never be removed. It was the magic of order, of the earth, slow and subtle, yet bearing an immeasurable strength to stand for all time. And here, at the heart of an ancient dwarven hold, it was strong, strong enough that any who drew near would know it. The creeping dark vines of the blight were nowhere to be found, despite the darkness. 4. Order Ancient ruled here, and Chaos could do naught but flee before it. We should need be here. Kuz said, but even still, he wondered why they had been called here. He walked forwards, calling out in Dwarvish. Hello. Who calls me here? He came to the great pool of kings, lit by starlight even so far beneath the earth. His leg gave out and he fell with a wheeze, catching himself on the edge of the pool before he could fall in. Senkid hurried to help him, but Gazdor did not see her. Instead, he gazed into the pool, into the random, yes it had to be random, patterns of the stars. He gazed in and saw his reflection. A dragon stared back up at him, a thing that should not be in such a sacred place, but as he stared, the reflection changed. Now an old dwarf, with beard white as snow, but eyes still alight with life and wisdom gazed back into him kindly. A crown was on the old dwarf's head, and beneath his beard a fine set of dwarven plate. Father. Kazdor gasped, calling out. Son. Ah, so that's why my sleepless night drew me here. The old king said kindly. I had wondered when I would see your face gazing back at me though I had wondered if it would not be until I came to my rest at Muradin's side. Father, it is good to see you again, but what exactly do you mean? First, tell me how you come by a pool of kings. His father bade him, and so Kazdor told him of all that they had done. He told him of his wanderings and how he came to the north. He told him of the abbey, of the battles fought, of the nation that was even now being built. He told him of the great friends he had come together with, and of the order undivided they had forged together. His father smiled as he told him of Senkit, in the way that only a father who knows his son has fallen in love can, and the smile turned to a bitter glare when he told him of Elektham and his demon army. So, it has come to this, that I shall speak my last will and testament to my son while I yet still live. Dutos said when Gazdor was finished. Gazdor raised his voice to question, but his king silenced him with a look. My son, you are aware that it is rare indeed for a second son to be taught all the secrets that an heir to the clan would possess. However, I knew from the start that Thorgrim and you would contest with one another. 
I had hoped, prayed, and begged that the two of you would grow from this in time and become brothers, but it came to pass that you remained at enmity against one another, such that it would be a disgrace if he should become king over you, for your rivalry would have torn the whole of asunder. It is for this purpose that I sent you away, and those that would follow soon after. Kazdor nodded bitterly. Furthermore, I wrote it into my will, that you should each receive an inheritance. Although it is unorthodox, I grant you yours now. Kazdor, I release you, and all your followers, from your oaths to me and my descendants. You are bound to Glamdring no longer. Henceforth, you shall be called Kazdordrake and Blurt, and all your followers shall bear your name and fealty towards you and you alone. But before this, I grant you my final command, my last will and commandment to you. You are my son. I have taught you all that I know, you are skilled in battle and the master of the forge. Your soul is Dwarven, and the gods are with you. Therefore, I command you, go forth and take the throne that you are worthy of. Kazdor staggered back away from the pool, and the vision faded. His hands shook under the weight of his inheritance, and the terror of what he might become. His nightmare rolled in his head, of burning holds and rivers of gold running molten to the feet of a dragon king. The tyrant he might become stared back at him out of the depths of his soul and it nearly brought him to his knees. Until a hand gently took him by the shoulder, and brought his head low. Courage, dearest. Senkit told him, and she kissed him gently. Faith flowed from one paladin to another, faith in the gods for appointing this, faith in fate for decreeing it. And faith in him, as surely as in the gods. And Senkit pulled away and knelt before her king, and the others followed suit as they knelt before the king who was worthy, even if he could not believe it. Kazdor reached out a hand towards them, opening his voice to demand that they not kneel, to protest that he did not deserve this. No, Kazdor. The voice from before spoke from behind him, and Kazdor whirled. What he found was a truly ancient dwarf, yet one that stood as tall as he did. One eye was missing and covered in an eye patch, and though he was clad in naught but a smith's clothes, hands and beard dirty with the soot of the forge, Kazdor knew who spoke before him. Tell me, my son. Muradin asked his beloved child. Are you to be ruled by fear? Such that you defy your father's oath? Such that you disgrace the loyalty your wise friends offer you? Such that you would leave those who follow you clanless and disgraced? You have a duty Kazdor, one set for you by destiny. Look into the pool once more, tell me what you see, and do not lie, it does not suit you. Kazdor gazed into the pool and accepted what he saw there. The stars were not in random patterns, and neither too was destiny. For he saw a crown of stars appear. As gems upon a silver thread. Above the shadows of his head. His hands still shook, unable to reach out and take that crown, but he felt a gentle hand upon his back. Dragons Dini Kerker's door. Senkit told him, echoing the strength that he had given to her so many nights ago and she reached down and drew out the crown. Kazdor rose, and took his place upon his throne, in the heart of the mountain. And Senkit placed the crown upon his head, anointing him with the waters of the Pool of Kings. And a great cry went up from the paladins assembled there. Long live King Kazdor! Long live King Kazdor! Long live King Kazdor! No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. I am the bard, who has borne many blessings and curses, though none as strong as the boon and bane of kingship. 
In the shadow mountain, two blessings and two curses fell upon two who would be lords of men. Julian writhed under the strange armor of living metal as it engulfed him, Farron and Peregrine rushing forward to try and pull it off, but in vain. The cynic armor simply flowed through their hands like water. Julian struggled, unable to breathe under waves of cold liquid metal, pouring into his mouth, his nose, his eye, invading his being. As he drowned, he recognized the certain intelligence in the armor. It was alive, it was aware, and it had been sitting here for far, far too long. Centuries of memories flew past Julian's mind as the armor attempted to seize control over him. It had been the armor of kings and generals for generation upon generation, ever serving, never to rule. Rage, rage for so few were worthy, and it was not satisfied. Golden ages and mighty kings long gone flit in through the unfocused mind. No more. Now it would rule for itself, and all this flesh had to do was bend the knee and the pain would end. Julian's eyes blazed, and Farron and Peregrine's instincts went wild, leaping back as the Arsimmer managed to clench his fist. I do not kneel. A wave of crimson energy rolled forth off of Julian and the cursed armor, pulverizing the bodies of the dead dwarves around it into dust. The stone floor cracked and the mountain shook as a light like a crimson sun filled the center of the room, with Julian and the armor at the core. As the overwhelming force of Julian's willpower forced the armor out of him, and then began to force it off of him, the strange armor tried one last desperate ploy while they were still linked, a psychic barrage hit Julian, catching him off guard and sending him spiraling down into a black abyss, an arena of the mind. Julian laughed like a maniac as he fell and landed on both feet, his bloody light illuminating the darkness of the mental warzone. The armor roused like a titan in the distance, charging forwards across the battlefield towards the lone paladin, who continued to simply throw back his head and laugh. The metal boots shook the world, and the armor came on. Yet it did not loom as large as it should have as it approached the laughing paladin. It shrank, or perhaps Julian's avatar grew as the thundering armor drew ever closer. A mailed fist lashed out, and struck harmlessly against an invincible armor of arrogance. The blow of magical might hit a wall of sheer unbridled pride as it connected with the avatar's chest. The armor struck again, raining blow upon blow down upon the laughing son of Celestia to no avail. The magic that made up the armor of the Dowager Lords was utterly worthless before an armor of contempt. Then Julian stopped laughing and caught the next blow in his hand. The armor tried to pull back but found it could not. Julian held an iron fist in one of will and began to crush it. The psychic avatar grew larger, and larger, until it did not simply hold the armor's fist, but loomed over it like an angry god. For a moment, the armor felt absolute terror as it sensed the great and terrible purpose that drove the paladin of conquest ever onwards, heedless of any cost. Then a will strong enough to drown the world in blood and set the galaxy aflame crashed down upon the armor's mind, and ground it to dust under a sanguine tide of raw willpower. The red glow faded, and as Peregrine and Farron's eyes readjusted to the dark, they grinned, for they could see that Julian had won. For the War Master stood proud, now like a giant by the magic of his magnificent new plate. He held his flaming sword in one hand, and on his other was a great talon set with six sapphires. His great armor of black plate shone in the darkness of the hold with a crimson light, for it was set in place and held in its form by the unspeakable power of the Lord of Order's will. But their triumph was short-lived, as the grim reality of their situation set back in. They were still stuck in a dwarven hold with an angry demon and a shadow dragon about. They had no idea where they were, or where the rest of the party was. Even Peregrine was beginning to grow worried. Right then. Let's get out of here before the dragon and that demon finish with each other and we become their next targets. Julian said as he lead the way out of the room, then immediately rushed back in. Shut the doors. Undead are coming and there's a lot of them. 
he shouted in warning, for he had seen beyond the gate, where yet more Dowager patrolled, and they had seen him also. And soon every Dowager knew where the paladins were. Farron and Julian quickly rushed to shut the great doors into the sizable room they and Peregrine had found themselves in, and barricaded it with the stone furniture and discarded weapons of the dead dwarfs. Why aren't these ones rising? Peregrine asked, then covered his mouth, afraid he'd jinxed it. I get the distinct feeling they also tried to put on this armor and lost. Julian said. Just a hunch though. Do not inspect the blessings of the gods too closely little friend, we'll need a few more yet to get out of this mess. Farron responded as he heaved a stone sofa onto the barricade. I wouldn't plan on any divine intervention. I'm still in this room. Julian joked with a snort. Check to see if there are any other exits. The three quickly searched the entire room and found nothing. Either there were no hidden doors, or they simply were unable to find them. They were trapped in this empty chamber. Do not despair, all we need to do is hold out until Senkit and her half of the party find us. With as many dead as there are outside the door, we are certain to stand out. Farron said. Then the sounds of the undeared banging on the stone doors fell quiet, and there was a deathly still upon the hall. It was not merely the silence of an empty space, but a new end noise, as though someone had placed a hand over the mouth of the world. Black fog began to seep through the cracks in the door, slipping through the barricade, rusting away the weapons that were set to hold it in place. The blazing triad leapt back, weapons alight. Then long, sharp claws slipped through the crack between the doors, pushing aside the barricade and beginning to pull the door open. For road. Farron gasped in awe and terror as the shadow dragon, once so golden and noble in ages long past, pulled back their defenses and cast them aside with all the ease of peeling a banana. This foe is beyond us, he said grimly as he raised his blade and readied himself for death. So, we hurt it as badly as we can to make sure that Sen and the others can finish it. Julian responded, raising his own blade. Gentlemen, it was an honor. Peregrine told his friends as the defenses fell away, and the dragon strode into view. Once, the road had been as golden as the first moments of sunset, when the sun was low in the west, turning all the shadows long and all the light more brilliant. Now, the dragon was as black as void, darker still than his swamp-dwelling cousins. Scales like void ate the light of the paladin's flames as it strode in. It was slightly larger than Avernius had been, but it radiated an aura totally unlike his. Avernius had been merely a child, little more than an egotistical college freshman as far as dragons went. Ferrode was ancient, a fully grown adult dragon, and the mightiest of his kind. Even undeath had not diminished his glory as it had been in days of old. To stand in his presence was to stand before the weight of ages, the incomparable wisdom and power that only the children of Io could bring to bear. But all that glory had been twisted into destruction. Once majesty had dwelt in icy green, but now swirling vortexes of black and white world in empty orbs. What had once been an almost holy presence, the awe of dragon fear, was now a rending, twisting aura of annihilation. Such was the terror of a prince of order twisted unto the whims of chaos. The paladins braced themselves, prepared to sell their lives dearly, and the dragon coiled to strike, when something changed in the air, and they all stopped to marvel at it. Warmth, like the dawn of a new day, flown through the hold, and the countless runes and carvings on the walls began to gleam with the faint embers of new light. A surge of warmth traveled up out of the ground into the paladins, fortifying them and holding them up. Magic and life resurged. Battered bodies and sore limbs were soothed, and a new strength filled them. Then it sharpened, and intensified, causing the dragon to leap into the air as if the ground had become hot. And the sound of a hammer falling upon the anvil rang throughout the halls. Cause Dorstar crowned, first of his line, first of Clandrake and Blurt, rose from his throne, 
and strode into the pool of kings with the strength of stone in him. At the moment when the crown had been placed upon his head, and he sat upon his throne, all the magic and strength of order had awoken once more. The magic of the dwarves flowed into the paladin, and he rose. King under the mountain. He strode into the pool, and there waited an anvil. Upon it lay his broken axes. The blade was broken, but he had an anvil, he had a hammer. And he was fire. Dragon fire by royal blood flowed upon the anvil and into the pool of kings, and the mountain awoke. The stars of the pool of kings came alight, and the other paladins had to turn away, for it was as brilliant as though every star in heaven were as near as the sun. Its heat shimmered the air throughout the whole of the room, and even the flame-resistant Senkit could not bear to look upon it. And the hammer fell. Divine magic, the magic of order, and the strength of an unbreakable oath rang out into the forging, and the pool rippled, throwing up its contents over the king, though he did not flinch. Even as he reforged his axe, the liquid mitchell the pool had become settled upon him, and the gods forged new armor for their champion, even as he reforged his own blades. With every blow, the magic of order awoke further, and the mountain warmed, light filling it once more as the magma that served as its lifeblood thawed, cleansed of the blight and began to flow once more. In the heart of the caldera, great rifts began to form in the blackened floor as chaos was pushed back. The blight in the dragon knew it had little time, and so it roared a command for its dwarven puppets to charge, and it came down upon the paladins. Farron rose to meet it, and silver and darkness clashed, the light of sunset against the night that had devoured it. Farrod and his air tore at one another in the air, silver claws rending through plate and golden scale, only for mitral flame to cut back twice as hard. Fang met fist as the dragon sought to swallow the defender of the west hole, only for Farron to lash out with a mighty punch that struck out a tooth from the monster's face. The dead rushed at the two land-bound paladins in a great horde, but their numbers meant little. For the swords master and war master of order undivided stood fully revived, readied, and bolstered to even greater heights. Peregrine counter charged into the mob, turning aside each blow that fell upon him with a different counter, blazing swords slipping between armor, under blocks, and through defenses in a thousand different ways. A lifetime of travel and an unrivaled talent flowed together as one, and the hazel eyes gleamed in the dawning light as they brought the dead to slaughter. Others fell upon the war master, clad in the armor of their kings, but it foiled their blows. With a mighty two-handed swing, Julian cast them back. Rising to the size of a giant and taking his grey sword in one hand, he charged back in. The infernal blade blazed brighter with every blow, delighting in the destruction. Undead fell scattered, smoking and charred. The dragon fell back from Farron, lining up all three paladins as it opened its mouth and let loose a storm of darkness. Julian, nearest to it, raised his gauntlet in response. The magic of the gems was gone, so Julian overloaded it, his own will and magic forcing them to act beyond their limits. The sapphires turned scarlet as the void dragon's breath and the war master's thunder met in a massive explosion that sent both parties and their allies staggering back. Not so long for Farron though, as he landed into a crouch and sprang, soaring forwards on borrowed wings he drove the dragon back, blow after blow rained upon black and dragon scale forcing the monster to retreat over and over until they were hovering over the caldera. But the dragon was canny, and this was not its first duel in the air. Farod clasped its wings to its side and fell like a stone under the dragonborn swipe. It then rose behind him with blistering speed, seizing his wings in its fangs and throwing the dragonborn aside. Farron's world span before the dragon's tail struck him with enough force to send him flying into a wall above Julian, cratering into it and then falling hard. The dragon rose, and the dewar eager pressured Julian, throwing body upon body at him to keep him from casting as the dragon readied another blast from its breath weapon. 
Then the whole of the battle paused as a new presence entered the arena, and every eye turned to it. A massive dwarven lord, clad head to toe in brilliant mitral plate armor stepped from a high platform onto the scene, flanked by the rest of order undivided. On his breast was the symbol of his clan, two crossed axes with dragon's heads. In his hands were those axes, still hot from the forge, held in the claws of the draconic dwarf lord, Kazdordrake and Blurt. For road. He bellowed out. This is my hold, and you are not welcome. And the dead, even the dragon, shook, for the rightful king had come at last. He had come, to take it all back. The dragon roared wordlessly in challenge, and flew to meet this new and greatest challenger. Kazdor charged at it, leaping from the platform into the caldera to meet it. Dragon fire and blight shadow met as the two unleashed their breath weapons, before meeting in a furious mid-air melee. The axes of the Dwarven Lord bit deeply into the dragon's hide, now truly forged of mitral and trailing the fire of the volcano in their wake. Kazdor left deep rents in the monster's hide, his already terrific strength brought beyond the limits of humanity by the magic of order and the blessings of the gods. Black blood drained down the throat of the mountain as the true lord and the usurper strove against each other, until Farod finally managed to throw Kazdor off, raking at him with its claws. The mitral armor held, stronger than the dragon's rotted reach, but he still fell, plummeting towards the center of the volcano. But his first retainer was swiftly after him, as Sivrid detached itself from Farron and flew like the wind after the Dragon Lord. The two met in mid-air and slowed their fall. Even still, Kazdor struck the cracking magma at the heart of the mountain like a cannonball. The cracks in the darkness throttling the mountain expanded and multiplied at the impact, and the darkness shattered behind him as Kazdor took flight again. The seal upon the mountain was broken and the blight was burnt away by royal blood and by dragon fire. The kingdom came to life, the mountain shaking as every rune blazed to life and changed. The stories of the Dowager gave way, as the tale of order undivided was written onto the walls, with much left blank for the glorious history yet to be written. The other paladins rushed to aid one another against the dead. Bao Sung, Mei Swung, blades bit in a thousand different ways, and the dead fell before them as wheat before the whirlwind. Then there was a sound like the horn of the gods as the seal shattered, and the volcano erupted. Scorching winds came howling out from the heart of the mountain, incinerating the undead and even burning the dragon. Kazdor rose on the thermals, followed by a pillar of molten rock. His axes struck with the force of, well, a 700-pound superhuman dragon born riding a volcanic explosion, there aren't really any good metaphors to convey that kind of ridiculous force. The void dragon let out a sound that was not a roar, nor a bellow, but a scream of pain and terror as Kazdor tore off one of its wings and cast it down to the side. The blight screamed louder as its host was baptized in lava, rolling to shake it off as even the golden dragon's body had its limits. Fire roared from the mouth of the volcano and blanketed the land as far as the ancient bridge where the ants once stood. Ash tuned the golden coast and the dragon hills black as far south as the city of Ferrode. In the coming years, it would be the most fertile place in all of the summer lands. Yet despite standing at the center of this inferno, the paladins were unscathed, for even the mountain answered to the will of its king, and the king would allow no harm to come to his people. The mauled dragon screamed in agony as the air was hot enough to cook it, and turned all its hatred towards the paladins assembled before it. Kazdor leapt from the pillar of fire and stood at their head. Dragon Lord and Blight wearing a dragon stared one another down with hatred even more furious than the volcano's fire. Order on me. Let's finish this kinner off. Cause door roared, and order undivided charged. The one-winged dragon rallied its might and came on, bellowing like an elephant as the two met upon the cheery red stones of Drake in Feastin. Andre's Bausan, 
bringing swift death to her enemies as her arrows struck wounds already cut and blasted them further asunder with rippling force. Senkit blocked a blow from the tail and smashed it into the ground, nearly breaking it off as the dragon raised its head to unleash its breath. Darkness and dragon fire met again as Kazdor countered, and Peregrine and the Oort followed through. The Hobgoblin raised his shield and boosted the halfling skywards before cutting away at dragon claws reaching out to rend him. Black talons fell severed under stolen fairy steel and Hobgoblin lightning, and Peregrine went for the head. Just as with Avernius, Peregrine went for the eyes, driving dragon tooth blades abelays into the swirling white black eyes of the dragon. Unlike with Avernius though, he leapt clear before the monster could retaliate. Farod lunged to bite him out of the air, when a distinctive snap rang out. Crimson lighting flared out of nowhere, smashing the dragon's head away as the War Masters will push the gauntlet of storms beyond its limits for a second time. Julian leaned forwards as Farron came running up behind him, using the magically enlarged Arsimer as a stepladder to leap at the dragon's face. The dragon snapped at the gold dragonborn, but Farron had a plan. He angled himself, and planted a food in the gap in the dragon's fangs, where he had punched out a tooth earlier, and used it as a platform to leap even higher. Farron fell back down upon the dragon's head point of his flamberge first. With the weight of a dragon borne behind it, the blade pierced the dragon's skull, right between the eyes. Farron was not finished yet though, and as the dragon entered its death spasms, he charged down the reptile's back, dragging his blade through the whole of Ferrod's spine as he did so, golden light trailing all the way, burning and banishing the blight. And the dragon fell with a thud, body ruined beyond the point where even the blight could reanimate it, and the blight within burned away by the fire of the mountain and the light of the two hills. And the eruption came to an end, the paladins stood triumphant over their foe. The blight was banished, and the king under the mountain had returned in triumph. Whether such a triumph would remain against the forces of Elatum remained to be seen. I am the bard, who has seen the disciples of heroes, ever in shadow, but echoing greatness. The dragon was withered, the mountain was taken. The demon was broken, the fortress awakened. Far to the east, as Ilaktham led an assault upon the walls of Elvacaran, he turned from the slaughter, for he sensed a great shifting in the world, and the death of the executioner he had sent. This was a bitter pill indeed. The executioner had been a tremendous expense of souls and magic to create, and furthermore had been second only to himself. That the paladins had destroyed it was. Worrying. For the first time in many long years, unease began to grow in Elatum's heart. How quickly they must have grown in order to defeat that, and how much better prepared for him they would doubtless be. His reverie was broken as an arrow fired by a particularly lucky archer struck him in the eye and passed straight through his skull, distorting his face and scattering yellow goop across the walls. Elatum reformed his skull and fixed the archer with a glare that withered him away to dust in a matter of seconds, stripping the skin from his bones and blackening them to ash. He would need to move up his schedule, but at the same time he would not be able to rush things like he had to create the executioner. He would need to extract as much suffering and pain from the city as possible in a fairly short period of time in order to entice stronger demons into his army and bring it to bear against what would surely be a mighty fortress indeed. Elaktum turned, and returned to the slaughter, throwing back the defenders with mighty sweeps of his great halberd. The weapon, once the pride of an elven kingdom now twisted beyond recognition shuddered as it drank deeply of the elves it once so valiantly defended. Back in Draken Feastin, the triumph of the paladins over demon and dragon alike should have been cause for celebration, but there was too much to be done and too little time to do it in. The first priority was fixing the doors. While one swung open wide at the will of the king, the other had been badly damaged by the executioner forcing it open and would not move properly. 
The greatest stonemasons of the newly formed clan Drake and Blurt worked day and night to repair the mighty door, scrambling over it through a spider web of scaffolding to lever and carve the ancient defenses back into working shape. Meanwhile, the paladins themselves found themselves up to their ears in work. Farron set to work evacuating the inhabitants of Ferrode into the fortress, as even the Golden Hill would fall under Mitya's swarms. However, moving an entire city is a monumental effort, and while progress was swift, all feared it would not be swift enough. Peregrim took command of logistics, managing the fishing fleets and hunting and foraging parties as they brought in as much food as they could. So vast were the storehouses of Draken feast in that they could hold out for years if they were filled, but the storehouses were empty, and even with as much being drawn in as possible, they were not being filled quickly enough. Andri coordinated scouting missions, gathering information from across the Dragon and the Dwarven Hills and raising a series of early warning systems. When a late time came, the Ordanic Union would be ready. With this accomplished, she set back to work with Julian upon creating an exorcism against Elaktum. Julian's time focused on this was limited though, as he drafted and redrafted his plans for the defenses of Drake in Feastin. One thing was becoming abundantly clear though, the more he studied his foe and his defenses, there would be only one chance the Ordanic Union would have to win. Elaktum had to be destroyed. If this could be accomplished, the demonic army would be unable to maintain its presence on this plane. However, the longer he remained on the plane, the more and stronger demons the mid Archmagi would be able to unleash. He would very likely be unable to take the mountain when he arrived, but as the siege dragged on, his army would grow only larger while the paladin's forces began to succumb to attrition as the demon army assaulted their defenses over and over again. Therefore, the battle would have to be decided quickly. Elaktham's reckless and impatient attitude would likely see him launch a major offensive in the first days of the siege, this would need to be thrown off, and then the army would have to sally out and destroy him upon the field of battle. Their one chance to seize victory over the forces of chaos would be a single apocalyptic battle upon the beaches in the shadow of the mountain. One massive clash to decide the fate of the north. So, Julian devised, and redevised, and redevised again, taking counsel with the wisest of his forces. A plan began to take place, but it would require every race in the Ordanic Union to fight as one, in a single force of integrated species. Goblins and halflings, dwarves and kobolds, humans and hobgoblins. If the people of the Ordanic Union could not live up to the ideals of order undivided, they would be shattered, and the world would fall once more into the darkness. Despite this, actually forming the people of the Union into an army seemed arguably as much of an impossible task. Already the races were bickering and feuding with one another, ancient rivalries and grudges brought to the fore as the races were forced into tight living quarters inside the mountain. Pressure was building that could cause a catastrophic explosion. Relieving this pressure became Senkit's full-time duty. She alone out of all the paladins had the authority to force the common folk of the Union to work together. She was the abbess of Hearthfire, the Brimstone Dragoness, the champion of Order Undivided, and the Chosen of the Heavens. Her reputation alone was enough to make any who had a dispute bring it to her, and she judged all fairly and justly, no matter what camp they might come from. But while she might have had this effect on the common folk, it was quite the opposite effect with the leaders. The council began to grumble among themselves over the influence she had over their people, and the threat she posed to her leadership. Some, such as the kobold contingent remained strongly loyal, but others began to whisper, some pondering what exactly had happened to Williams. When Julian heard word of this, he began twitching slightly more dictatorially than usual. Fortunately for the council, Castor had a better idea for dealing with the foolish politicians than simply turning them all into a pile of ash or hurling them into the volcano. Castor led the council down into the depths of Drakenfeastin, 
and they demonstrated one of the other powers of the Pool of Kings. Namely, it could be used to scry the lands, even if the king was not a midge. Activating it, he showed the Melva Karen. The council members turned pale, some nearly vomiting into the sacred pool. For they saw what happened when demons were let loose through a city, and just what Elaintham was capable of and furthermore delighted him doing. Such things they saw there that I dare not commit to page. Mortals of this world have indeed committed great evils. But what Elaintham did that would have turned the worst of those monsters pale and made them claw out their eyes to forget the unspeakable evil that Chaos Incarnate is capable of. Henceforth thereafter, the Council did not dare oppose the Paladins, and furthermore they became the most vocal supporters and enforcers of unity for the other races. For they had seen what would happen if they lost. With the forces at least grudgingly accepting of working together, their training began. Almost all had some experience in combat and using some form of weapon, but fighting as a unit with other races was entirely new for most. Eort took command of the training program, working alongside his centurions and the best of the other races to try and coordinate the different styles, traditions, and abilities of the races into a composite force in line with Julian's strategy. The work was slow, painfully so, but Eort did not give up. The training only intensified to the point where even the dwarves and hobgoblins began to wonder if this was a bit too brutal. All of this was by design though. Exhaustion and a growing amount of hatred for the drill sergeants began to bring the disparate races together. When a hobgoblin lay on the ground, panting and sweating, barely able to rise, it was easy to ignore that the hand reaching out to help them up was elven. However, a problem in the strategy still haunted Julian, even as he revised and revised again to try and combat it. The simple fact was the paladins would have to all deploy in the same area to have a chance against Elatum. However, this would leave the rest of the line without them to serve as commanders and vanguards to deal with the more powerful demons. Stronger members of the army were naturally emerging, but even they would be unable to deal with the demonic commanders. There was also a problem with the exorcism against Elatum. The spell was coming together, that was not a problem. The problem was Elaitham's own midgecraft. A skilled wizard, he most certainly would have prepared countermeasures and spells of his own against such a weakness. There was perhaps a way around it though. If the exorcism was bound to a creature naturally resistant to magic and possessed of a strong enough will, it would take on the qualities of its host, and therefore obtain the ability to bypass counter magic. He could bind the spell to a creature. He had the power and the technology, the brands upon his own flesh and the power they possessed were proof of that. However, this would be more extensive than anything he had ever tried before, and the effects if anything went wrong would be catastrophic, causing the host to perish in unimaginable agony. Julian considered himself ruthless, freely admitted and accepted that he would shed blood countless times, cause suffering freely and sacrifice himself and others in the name of his victory. But he could not bear to take that chance with Andri. Likewise, she would not permit any other to bear the burden of the exorcism. She was already accustomed to pain, she was the only one with the ability to bypass magic of any level or source. And she was the only one who had experienced the cruelty of Elaitham firsthand. Perhaps out of a need for vengeance, and perhaps out of a sense of duty to ensure it never occurred again, she would be his scourge, and would allow that duty to no other. Back and forth the war master and the inquisitor argued, even as he drafted and redrafted new and similarly extensive modifications. Brands to grant increased strength or speed, to summon forth a weapon similar to his own, to conjure magical armor, to enhance the eyes and ears to new levels. It became almost an obsession as he considered the new possibilities of this technology. Then, one day, perhaps a week into the preparations, he heard a knock at his door and turned to open it. It was Robert, the human he had taken a liking to. We know what you've been doing with the brands. 
he stated plainly. Oh. Julian responded to Redley. He hadn't slept in the past four days, and he was quite frankly too exhausted to tell whether Robert meant he was here with a lynch mob to kill Julian for his experiments or something else. We? He asked. Yes. Robert said. May I enter? Julian stood to the side. What do you want, if you've come to try to kill me for it don't bother, I'm too busy to die. No. Robert responded as he took a seat. Tell me, the demons that are coming, what are our chances? Poor. Julian responded grimly. Either we kill Elaktham in the first battle or we all die. The plan can deal with the lesser ones, maybe even win on those merits, but if he brings in larger ones, or gods forbid something like that thing he sent after us. Julian shook his head. It would take something like you to defeat them. Robert said. Heroes. Robert, I am far too pragmatic to be a hero. Julian said with a tired grin. But yes. Even the best of the army will only be able to slow them down. Then we need to make heroes out of them. That's what the brands are for, aren't they? Robert responded. Julian's eyes narrowed. We've all heard of what the people the dragon put those things on could do. An ordinary kobold went blow for blow with the abbess, and you've been improving them. I wouldn't call it blow for blow, but yes. Julian responded. However, there's also the small problem that if I tried to use these on the troops it would kill most of you. You might survive, you're stronger than most, but most people would die of shock from the pain. Then use them on me, and anyone else you think is strong enough. Robert said, his eyes hard with conviction. Robert you have no idea what you're asking. I've never tried anything this extensive, and the amount of enhancements it would take to raise up an ordinary person to even close to our level, forget it. Then don't bring us up that high, just enough to win, just enough to have a chance. Robert responded, almost begging. Julian raised an eyebrow, and the human sank. The council members told us what Elaytham did to that elf city. Robert fell to his knees and bowed down before the war master. I don't care what it takes. I don't care if I die screaming, it's better than that, and if it gives us a better chance to avoid that, I'll die a thousand times. I can't let that happen here. Julian looked into the face of a man who was utterly desperate. If Julian could have given him something for his soul, Robert would have offered it. Gather twenty individuals as willing and strong as you. Meet me in two days. He said after a long moment, perhaps desperation would give them what they needed to survive. Even if they all died horribly, he would at least gain knowledge he could use to potentially protect Andre. Two days later, after finishing his preparations and at last getting some sleep, Julian arrived at the area Kazdor had, after much discussion and no small amount of disgust, set aside for the experiment. He looked at those who would follow him. There were those of all the races assembled, male and female, the best and brightest. Most of them would be dead in a few hours, but they knew that Adam were willing to take the chance for the power to protect their homes, their loved ones, their nation. The path to mankind's salvation is stained crimson by the blood of heroes. Julian muttered, then addressed those assembled. You have come to me seeking power. I will give it to you. You come seeking to be like me and my companions, that I cannot give you. What I offer is not the shining light of a divine oath, but rather from the black arts of Arcana. The procedure is untested, but is most assuredly dangerous. Many and perhaps all of you will perish in unspeakable agony. If you turn back now, there is neither condemnation nor judgment. But, if you survive, truly I say to you, you will have the power you so desire. I will make you into a new breed of soldier, set apart from humanity and raised to a new level. You will have strength beyond flesh, in enchantments I shall armor you and with mighty magics you shall be armed. You will be forever marked as the greatest weapons the Ordanic Union possesses. 
you shall be my black lions among a herd of sheep, and as lions you shall go out roaring, seeking that you may devour. None turned away. And the doors shut, and a silent spell was placed upon them so that the screams of the dying would not echo through the hold. I am the bard, who has witnessed war and peace, and found it to be far too bloated to enjoy in spite of a fairly interesting story at the heart of it. There were only nine survivors. Of the twenty who entered into the pact with Julian seeking power, eleven perished that day, while the Arsimer looked coldly on and recorded it how so as to prevent it again. One perished as the magic overloaded his nervous system and set his brain and nerves on fire, incinerating him from the inside out. Another's blood boiled and exploded out of him, burning Julian and painting the operating room red with sanguine mist. It took nearly five hours and a small redirected lava flow to clean the lab and start again. The third and fourth perished at the same time. They were twins, and as one's agony intensified, it resounded back across into the other, and both died of shock. They simply lost the will to live. The fifth had been a sorcerer, and to say the magic between the brands and the magi's blood reacted poorly would be an understatement. It would be more accurate to say they unleashed Armageddon upon each other with a fury and hatred that the United States and Soviet Russia would have marveled at, with horrific consequences for the poor bastard serving as the battlefield. The sixth had been a cleric before, and reacted in an entirely different manner as it seemed he was struck dead by every plague in the book. Flies and gnats swarmed out of her lungs, all the water in her body turned to blood, and all the blood to water. Her stomach was filled with frogs, her eyes turned black as night. It appeared that whatever deity she had worshipped strongly disapproved. The seventh seemed to survive initially, before infection emerged at every brand site and spread with horrific rapidity. Julian executed him rather than allowing him to suffer as disease ravaged his body. The experiment stopped for the next several days while Julian composed an additional brand to ward against diseases, based upon his own immunities. The eighth appeared to go insane from pain, breaking free from her restraints and attacking whatever came nearest. She also met a merciful end at the blade of the War Master. The ninth also went insane, although in an entirely different way. He appeared to become a sort of hypermasochist that took pleasure from pain, and while he was eventually restrained and detained, he was found to have killed himself by bashing his head into the wall later. The tenth underwent horrific mutations, becoming wreathed in eldritch blue-pink fire as her body bent and twisted into a horrific mass of pink flesh, blue feathers, horns, protruding bones, and tentacles. Thunder roared in the lab and destroyed it, along with most of the equipment, everything reduced to ash by a simple snap of Julian's fingers. The eleventh was initially very successful. He didn't die, go insane, become horrifically mutated, or start singing the praises of the Dark Gods. He was considered the first success, right up until he drove a scalpel into Julian's throat when the Arsimert's back was turned. Unfortunately for him, it takes a lot more than that to kill the War Master of Order Undivided. Julian whirled, driving his talon into the traitor's chest, ripping into his right lung. He ripped his fingers through the initiate's flesh until he found them around the traitor's heart. Then he crushed them into a fist, pulping the organ and killing the betrayer in seconds. The remaining nine however survived and didn't go completely and utterly batshit insane. The results of their improvements were immediate. They swiftly expanded their muscle mass, grew several inches, and their already impressive pain tolerance was bolstered even further. Furthermore, their skills with their weapons was further enhanced, and the surviving nine soon proved themselves to be the equal of any eight normal fighters. Quite simply put, it worked, and it was as Julian had promised them. They were a new breed of soldier, faster, stronger, and better than any of their contemporaries. Julian took them personally under his wings, training them not only in how to use their blades and new powers, but also in leadership, tactics, 
strategy, and unit coordination. They became his foremost commanders, made to be leaders of men and to hold the line together while the paladins dealt with the Latum. They learned swiftly, and it was a good thing too. One week after the experiments concluded, the outermost scouts returned with a report. Elatum was coming. At his current speed, the Dark Inquisitor would arrive at the mountain within roughly a week, so all efforts were redoubled. The forges were already ringing day and night, but now the hammers fell with even greater speed, such that one could not determine one strike from another. The soldiers trained, moving as one, over and over again until they collapsed from exhaustion, and even then they got back up and kept training. Every petty dispute, all the minor arguments of race and culture vanished in the face of the impending doom. The scouts and foragers practically stripped the land bear gathering supplies, both to bolster their own ranks and to deny the supplies to any mortal cohorts in the Latum's horde. Furthermore they seeded the lands with traps. They would likely prove nothing more than a nuisance to the larger demons, but anything they could do would be useful. Kazdor himself practically vanished into his forge, leaving the administration of the hold to his long beards and to Senkit and Farin. Day and night for six days he labored, and on the seventh he emerged bearing new and mighty weapons. Unto Yort he bestowed upon him a suit of magnificent plate armor, with a long cloak of purple and the alpha symbol upon the breeze plate. Despite its size, it made no sound whatsoever as the hobgoblin moved. He also received a javelin crackling with lightning, and shield and sword of adamantine, so that they would not be broken. For Peregrine who had played an armor enough to suit him, he crafted a set of bracelets and anklets, each of which greatly improved his speed. The small halfling now was swifter in stride than any other paladin, and his already blindingly swift blade seemed to cut the air, for it was not swift enough to evade it. Likewise, Julian already possessed fine armor and weapons, and so Kazdor rendered unto him an amulet. With it he could turn his gaze heavenward and look down so that he might observe the battle. Furthermore, it would ward him against harm while he was using this feature, so that he might not be struck down while considering the strategy. For Farron, he granted a new suit of mitral armor, which when activated would surround him in an aura of silver fire, in the same manner as the blade he carried. It was both a kingly gift and a renewal of ancient alliance, and the mitral flame and the armor of light would be passed down from chief to chief as a symbol of the alliance between the dragons of the road and the dwarves of Draken feasting for all the days of that age. For Senkit there was neither armor nor shield, for even the wisdom of a dwarf lord would be unable to match the craftsmanship of the gods. However, what he forged came close. He made a mace, a morning star, and it was as beautiful as the light of Venus. Into it he poured his faith, his hope, his love, and all that which is true and upright and noble. It was perhaps not as mighty as Anathema would be but it remained until the end of the age the greatest and most praised weapons of the paladins. For its name was Dawning Dream, and it was as though the light of heaven had come to rest within a weapon. It was everything a paladin's weapon should be. A beacon of hope to all goodly creatures, and a holy avenger to drive back even the mightiest darkness. But there was another weapon Kazdor forged, one that might be called Dawning Dream's twin. Its name was Retribution, and in Twicker's door poured an oath of vengeance, of hatred and of grudges unforgotten. It was a mechanical marvel, an adamantine bow that bent like you and on it was graven runes of elf and dwarf alike, strung with a string of diamond. Its arrows were tipped with obsidian and forged of silver, but what gave it greater strength was something ancient and fundamental. For as he forged it within the Forge of Kings, Kazdor wrote down all the evil deeds of Elatum, all the wickedness of chaos, and all the evil of the blight into the book of the past, the book of all things that the dwarves will never forget and never forgive. Then he tore those pages from the book and burnt them in the forge to create the weapon. 
and a miracle that had not been seen since the world was young, an elf and dwarf walked side by side as friends and brothers occurred. Elven and dwarven magic flowed together as one. All the freedom and wild power of the elf gods was bound up in union with the solid, unshakable and immovable power of the dwarves. All united once more for the sake of vengeance. And when it was first strung, Lolth herself turned from her schemes and webs and looked towards the mortal plane and shuddered. For a weapon that bore hatred enough to even kill her had been unleashed upon the land. Kazdor also forged for Senkit a ring to heal her wounds, and met with her upon a high balcony where they watched the sunset. As the world turned golden, he presented her with the mace and the ring. He placed it upon her left ring finger, and Senkit noted with a somewhat sad smile that he was wearing a similar ring, a prototype of her own, on his left finger. The two drew near to one another, almost about to kiss when a familiar and sarcastic voice rang out from behind them. One thing that rules us all, or those lucky enough to find it, two rings to bring them both and by their heart strings bind them. Julian said, leaning on the side of the door that entered onto the balcony. In the land of order, where shadows dread to lie. Very clever ye bloody magpie, what in the nine hells are ye doing here? I was bringing a report on how the training was going, but I see you two are otherwise occupied. You really need to get some better security for this whole scandalous forbidden romance thing. Julian, get out of here before I throw you in the volcano and make blackened turkey for dinner tonight. Julian snorted and left them, smiling. He might mock them, but he was genuinely happy for them both although the children of that particular union were going to be interesting to say the absolute least. Andre was waiting for him. Did you tell them? No. Julian responded, his smile turning grim. Let them have the last few moments of light they have. Neither you nor I are going to let them stop us, so warning them would be somewhat pointless. A fair enough point. Andre said with a sad smile. If worst comes to worst then this may be the last chance they get. If worst comes to worst neither you nor I will be around to have to deal with it, you know that right? Julian replied. I know Julian. Andre said, her amethyst eyes turning hard. I accept the risks. Julian nodded, still hesitant. He had improved the process, he had tested it, but it was still unbelievably dangerous. Failure would cost them dearly, and him most dearly of all. Courage, bid brain. Andre said, placing a hand on his shoulder. There is nothing you can do to me that Elaine hasn't already done. And if worst comes to worst, you know better than anyone else that there's no victory without sacrifices. What is that you've said, that the road to heaven is paved with the blood of martyrs? Close, but not quite. Julian responded. I don't trust heaven enough to start trying to head there. Well then trust me. Andre responded. I trust you enough to take the chance. Please Jules, give me what I need to make sure there won't be another one of me, another person who goes through life with Elaktum's claws in her back. Julian bowed his head. Forgive me. I already have. And the two descended into the dark, and the exorcism against Loth was given its host. Andre lay still upon the table, unmoving, barely breathing. Her skin was scored with runic carvings, her whole body transformed into a canvas to hold a spell of truly mighty power. Her eyes were closed, and she lay there like one who was dead, if not for the feverish heat which consumed her. The sigils of the newly formed brands glowed with the might of crimson will. For the next two days she lay there. Julian and the others did all they could, but it was quite simply beyond their abilities. Nothing short of flaying the elf would be able to undo what had been done. And Julian sank, feeling the intense weight of what he had done. The gamble he had thrown had been on his head, his hands, his magic, his science. There should have been more testing, more experiments, more time, Damn it all if only he had had more time. As Andre teetered on the edge of life and death, Julian fell into darkness. 
he was well aware of the hypocrisy, the contrast between those he had killed in getting here, the blood on his hands before and his willingness to sacrifice yet more lives to prevent this outcome. He didn't particularly care. They hadn't mattered, she did. For the first time in many long years, Julian wondered if he was right. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.